Hi, this is Jonathan from the NoCo Dynasty League in Loveland, Colorado, and you're listening to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. <laughs> Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast, coming to you from pristineauction.com studios with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Oh, welcome in. I'm Andy Holloway, joined as always by Jason Moore and Mike, the Fantasy Hitman Wright. Welcome to the show. I wasn't even the first one to welcome you. Jonathan was the first one to welcome Rock you. Rock the fast bow. One of our mighty, mighty esteemed Foot Clan. Yeah, what do you, what'd you think? You like you like hearing from the, the Foot Clan introducing the show? Is there a special energy? Yeah, I mean, look, this show is, we have a special community, the Foot Clan out there. I mean, we're not the same without the Foot Clan, so we felt like bringing them in. You're a part of the, You are this show. Yeah, so we uh, we're adding a uh, new little new little wrinkle, new little wrinkle to the show. Mm. If you're a Foot Clan supporter over at jointhefoot.com, we're gonna get some show intros. You can brag about your league or your team or whatever you want. So, all right, great show today because you're gonna have to explain yourself. Explain yourself. Uh, the weather in Arizona needs to explain itself, by the way, as well. It's yeah. delightful. It's if late May it. and it's raining outside. And it's cool. It's cooled. It it's cooled off. Makes no sense. We're, I, s- we're supposed to be swimming. Well, no, I I think the reality is this is where we've always heard like oh, California is about to drop off. Right. This is just the preparation mm. for that. Wait, California is going to drop off into the ocean? Yeah, we're, we're about to be beachfront. Like, learn to swim. Yeah. What? I mean. So Maynard said. Would there be a quick rush to the border then to like claim land? Because I, I, I'm assuming I all think- the land on the California Arizona border. It's probably not all like publicly it's owned. It's not publicly and- owned, but I don't think the rush for right next to where land just fell off <laughs> to death is like going to be the hot commodity. Like, really? Let's build there. Yeah, right next to the uh, sinkhole. <laughs> yes, uh, that's fair. That's a fair point. Uh, but it is nice outside, and it's nice inside. We've got a great show. You can follow us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. We are basically going to be looking at our rankings today. And where there is a great disparity between mm. one of us and the other two. So some of the disagreements or uh, players that we are really high on or really low on, we're going to have to explain ourselves to the judge, uh, Giamatti himself, and to each other. That's it. Um, quick question for the day. This one was sent in from Brad. He says, how should being on from the... From Brad Schussel. Yes, Brad Schussel. Schussel. Thank you, Mike. It sounds like a streusel. It sounds delicious. <laughs> How should being on the turn in your fantasy draft influence your draft strategy? And now being on the turn, that means you're the last pick or the first pick in a round. So you've got the 11-12, and then you don't pick again for a long period of time. I know for me, that means I throw ADP out the window. Yep. Like, I... I hate being on the turn for that reason because I love playing the ADP game. I have the average draft position where it's like, uh, you know, I think I like this guy, but he should, you know, I'm only five picks away. He probably won't be drafted yet. I'm going to skip picking him, and then I still get him with my next pick. But every time that I've tried to play that game, when I'm on the turn, I lose that game. Yes. You cannot let it ride when you're on the turn. No, so you just got to pick the guys you like. Like, don't. If you if there's a guy you want and you think ah is this too early it's not draft the guys you want it's a big gamble is what you're saying you just have so many variables between your pick and the next time you get to pick so if you have somebody that you have to get better to look stupid drafting them early and get the right guy yep uh, uh, another tip if you guys don't have one I find that when I do mine I I am Maybe maybe this is just uh, I'm drafting afraid, but I find that I am less inclined to go running back, running back, or wide receiver, wide receiver. Mm. Not know like early in a draft, not knowing what the runs will be later. I just feel like I need to diversify a little bit better on each turn. I find 
myself taking a running back and a wide receiver. I, I was actually going to say I'm even more unlikely to take a shot on a tight end or a quarterback. Sure. Because I have no frame of reference between now and 22 picks later whether or not there's going to be a run, whether the value is really there. I find myself being a little bit more close to the vest by the book. Um, Mike, do you have anything you want to add or are you good? Nope. I'm, I'm with Jay, though. I, I, I usually end up a bit more balanced than positional heavy. All right. Uh, be sure to check out the community at jointhefoot.com and then tickets for the live tour of the show. They are available at ballerslive.com. Chicago, New York, San Francisco, L.A., Phoenix. Our live tour f this summer, it's going to be fun. It's going to be awesome. And Chicago is the first stop. So get your Chicago it tickets is. right now. Ballerslive.com. You guys want to talk some news? Yes, sir. News and notes from around the league. Presented by Sleeper. Very enthusiastic. Are you present? I'm here, yes. I'm I'm excited. I'm yeah, ready. I, I felt like it was more of this help. It was a little it was rhetorical. He was asking the question to the soundboard. Carson Wentz. No limits for Carson oh. Wentz at OTAs. It's like a t-shirt brand. No limits. No limits. Brought to you by Carson Wentz. What is it what does it matter with uh Carson Wentz and no limitations? Do you read into that? Yes. No. I do. I do very much. Because my explain yourself. <laughs> I'll I'll explain myself. Uh, the the injury that he had with his spine is one that is, um, you know, the, the pro football doc from last season was talking about how this could be something that really holds him back in the off season. And so I I wanted to see when he is a true. They're also talking extension with him. So full go. Well, it would be really smart to me of the Eagles to extend him now. Versus if he comes out and has a great year and then have to, you know, pay crazy out the nose. But, uh, yeah, I, I think this is great news if you're a Carson Wentz owner or fan. The fact that he's not limited at this point in the year is great. Ezekiel Elliott. Yeah. Released without charges but was handcuffed in Las Vegas. A music festival, if you watch the video, basically gave a little forearm shiver to a security guard. I, we were talking in the car on the way to lunch when this happened. Do, you know, do you believe that Ezekiel Elliott could receive a punishment from the league? If this was anybody that does not if, have a record. If this was a first-time offense where someone was in trouble, then no. And I, to be clear, when I say doesn't have a record, I mean a record with the league as yeah. being disciplined by the league because there's a history there. I think it is possible – that we see some repercussions. It didn't look like a severe situation by any stretch, but because Zeke has been in down this road, do you think one or two games is possible here? I it, yeah, I think that two games is possible, and, and it's it, he was antagonistic in the video. I mean, there's also him it, it, the 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 lady he was with, where he's he's physically pr putting himself in the way so she cannot walk away. I mean, the combination of those things and then getting in the face of someone who literally could not back up. I mean, the, the security guard is pressed up against a, uh, a metal gate. So it, a two game would not surprise me. I'm, the, the, I'm not saying like for sure he would get suspended, but you, uh, I, I think that the team will be preparing as such. It's within the realm of possibility. Yeah. That's for sure. John Ross missed the Bengals veteran volunteer mini camp because oh. of one word. Tightness. Now, just is, tightness. Is this like the good kind where it's like he's so tight? No. No, I don't think so. No, no, no. Right. This is it's like tight. I think this is the bad kind. Which is like clothes too the, tight? The John Ross kind. Oh. Where all of his muscles are so tight that he's very fast and also injured. John Ross, yoga. Check it out. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, at some point, you look at what's gone on with John Ross's short career, and you see a guy who ran a really nice 40. We, you and I, Andy, yes, he, he sure did. Uh, we made a trade this offseason in our Dynasty League that I regret. Do you? <laughs> yes. I mean, literally. All, all on, only because of this news? No. Literally on today's episode, I am splaining myself about my love for Mark Andrews this season. And I traded away Mark Andrews. For John Ross. For John Ross. Yeah, but yes, your you team did. is tight. Yes, it is. <laughs> my team is very tight. Thank you, Mike. All right, Jeff Howe reports uh, the fact that he believes, and that's from The Athletic,
that Rex Burkhead will only be active if the Patriots carried five running backs on the active roster. This goes in line with kind of our discussions on the show. You've got Sony Michelle. You know Damian Harris will be there, high draft capital rookie. You know that Brandon Bolden's on special teams. James White. You know James White is involved. So, yeah, the math adds up for Burkhead to need to be yes. the fifth active guy unless something happens to Harris in the offseason or Burkhead is capable on special teams if something happens to Bolden. Otherwise, it's not looking good for Burkhead. Yeah, there is, there's a lot of a lot of mall patrolling that's going to be going on. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. All right, last bit of news. The Texans released tight end Ryan Griffin. Okay. Yeah, but wasn't this like forever ago? No, no, no. It was they, a little he while was, ago. He was um, arrested. Yeah, he got in trouble at the NFL draft, but they didn't release him until just a few days ago. He got arrested at the draft. Yes, it was at in Nashville. Was he trying to be drafted again? <laughs> I don't believe so. But they right. did draft an interesting prospect in the third round. Yes, so they did. Keep your eyes they had open. Jordan Thomas. But, right? You know, I don't think there's a relevant this year redraft player coming out of there. All right, that was today's news and notes, as always, brought to you by the Sleeper app. Be sure to check it out. It is the solution for many of you looking for a great league hosting platform. Without further ado, let's get into it. I'm quite well, thank you. No, clearly you are not. No rational person would do as you have done. Explain yourself. Speaking of finales that didn't let you down, am I right? No. No. We're not getting into that. <laughs> Although no. rational is not the point of reference that I would put like, you know, Jason, I don't think he's he's seeking rationality on a daily basis. Is that your like it highest goal never comes into my goal list. My <laughs> when I make a, a chart of my goals being rational, I'm not, not sure there. a chart of your goals fits into a chart of my goals. No, I've never made a chart of my goals <laughs> because that's opposed that to is... what my theoretical chart of goals would have on it. That's that is correct. All right, that's the yeah, Here, here's We've... here's the chart of my goals. Have the most accurate draft ranking. Yes, there you go. Yes, and... which you've done before. You. You uh, you have a number three finish in your uh, resume. So tell us why you despise T.Y. Hilton because you, you have big T dummy. You have T.Y. Hilton at 12. And honestly, I think it is as much Jason having to explain himself about 12. It's Brooks, far. Brooks could have made Mike and I explain ourselves, too. Yes. And except I, we uh, we agree. We we. Did not talk about T.Y. Hilton. We statted him out completely independently, and somehow he's we, number six. We both came up with the exact same idea. Right. The, so let me tell you why you two both came up with the wrong I thought idea. You said bozos. You two bozos. You two bozos came up with both the wrong idea. T.Y. Hilton's great. Right. We all love him. I've got him as my wide so receiver. So far, so good. My wide receiver, twelve. So obviously, I think he's. Going to have a very good year, be a wide receiver one, but the back end of it. Why do I – I I do not believe T.Y. Hilton is a top five, top six type of prospect, and the reason why is touchdowns. He's just not a touchdown guy. We He's had years and years with Andrew Luck as his number one. What has he done with that time? He's been great. He's been fantastic. He's led the league in yards before. But what hasn't he done? Even though he's got Andrew Luck throwing touchdowns, he's not really been a huge touchdown guy. His career high in touchdowns is seven. He's usually, you know, six, five, four touchdowns. Like, he's not a touchdown scorer. So my point is, if you look back to 2013, that's as far as I went. I'm sure it holds up much longer than that. But that, that gives 30 opportunities for a top five wide receiver in those seasons since 2013. Only two times has there been a top five wide receiver with fewer than seven, with seven touchdowns or fewer, fewer than eight touchdowns has only happened two times out of 30. Now, I will grant you that one of those two was actually T.Y. Hilton when he was number mm. five, but that's not where he usually finishes. T.Y. Hilton's, you know, over the last several years, Last year was good. He was the 14th wide receiver, missed a couple games. Prior to that, a model of health as far as games played, 16 a season. 
he was the 25th wide receiver, the 21st wide receiver, the 11th wide receiver, the 19th wide receiver. Always a good wide receiver. But I think saying that just because he's the number one Andrew Luck is not factoring in what his specific skill set is and what his limitations are. And you have other better options now for in zone work. You know, Devin Funches, Paris Campbell, uh, Doyle healthy with Ebron. I, I don't think all of a sudden this is the year where it's like, he's the red zone guy. He's going to get eight, nine touchdowns. He's going to have a career high in touchdowns. Unless he does, he's a back end wide receiver one, not a top end wide receiver one. Well, and I think, you know, Mike, you can speak for yourself. We both ended up with him at six. This was a product of, of statting him out. I've got him near the league lead in total yardage, which he's done before. Uh, I've got him with 90 receptions. And if you look at the 85 career games with Andrew Luck, you're dead on. I mean, seven touchdowns is his paced average with Andrew Luck. That's all you're ever going to bank on. Like, if, if either of us were sitting here saying we thought 10 touchdowns was coming for T.Y. Hilton, we would have been betraying the history we have, right? Yep. It's just a matter of high volume in terms of yardage, and then I think a high volume in terms of targets and receptions. But you do have the injury concerns with Hilton. There's no doubt about that. Sure. And I think that this year with players like Antonio Brown not being in that top six guys for, for me, I don't know if he is for you, Mike. He's not. You know, that's another player that found himself behind T.Y. Hilton instead of in front of him moving Hilton up in the ranking. I mean, we it's it's recent history for me for T.Y. Hilton. I, and I have him matching his career high in, in touchdowns. I have him hitting that seven mark. But 2016 is when he led the league in yards. The very next year, that's when he didn't have Andrew Luck for an entire season. And then this year, if he had played 16 games, he would have he would have been right out, right around the yard as he hit in 2016 because he was actually averaging – 0.2 yards, uh, 0.2 yards more per game. So that that's where I am with T. Y. Hilton. Just the recent history of the evolution of him as a wide receiver, the evolution of Andrew Luck as a quarterback. I think that it it would be easy for T. Y. Hilton to be in that 1,400 yards again or range again. Yeah, I don't think that there. You know, to kick off this segment, I'm not sure the Hilton debate is extremely controversial. Jason still finds him to be a repugnant. He finds him to be repugnant. Yes, yes. By, yeah, so by my, ranking my him wide at, receiver one. By yes. ranking him above. You should be where he finished last ashamed year. Ashamed of yourself. <laughs> um, but Mike, th look, I couldn't disagree with you more on your take on this next guy. Jason and I both have him at ten. He's our consensus eleven. But you got him at sixteen. Yep. And that's Dalvin Cook, Mike. You, uh, you hinted at why you disagree on Cook being a top-end guy on a recent show, probably the, I think the last show we did, I remember thinking Mike is super wrong at that time. Mm. So please explain yourself. It's it's just all about volume for Dalvin Cook. It, the, the volume through the air will absolutely be there. That's why I have him up at 16. But I think that the Vikings, have just with what they have seen from Dalvin Cook, which is a, a player who has shown himself to be very injury-prone, that you can't give him 250 carries. He's not that type of a player. He, he's much more right around that 200, maybe up to 210 mark. And so I, I, but, I just don't but, see his own oh, goodness. But Mike. Yes, voice of public opinion. Latavius Murray is gone. And, yes. And, and Dalvin Cook was the RB6 from weeks 13 through 17. Sure. So he can be Let's, in that upper echelon. He, uh, yeah, he absolutely can. I just don't have him projected there. And it's Latavius Murray is gone. Alex, Alexander Madison is in. He was a third-round draft pick. Third-round draft pick is right on that cutoff where players can be very fantasy, uh, have, have great fantasy value. I mean, Dalvin Cook was a second-round pick himself. So the team is they're, – they're perfectly fine moving into the season with Dalvin Cook and Alexander Madison. If you look – at I worry Cook about, last year. I worry about the health. Yeah, so I, he's you, riskier than others. You look at him last year, ten or few carries of six in six of eleven games, and then you have what most people are looking at. Well, the OC was fired with just a couple games left, and the OC was fired the very next game. Dalvin Cook had his, the most touches, the most yards of the season. Yeah, that's true. That game was also against the Miami Dolphins, who were the second worst rushing defense in the league. In that game where, where Dalvin Cook had himself a time, Latavius Murray also had 15 carries 
in that game. So that that was a product of game script. And then after that, you saw the, the carries trail down for Dalvin Cook. So it's it's just a matter of volume on the ground. I don't think that he will get to the range where he needs to be a top-end running back one. Yeah, I mean, we I, I, I fully believe from what I've read about the Vikings and, and their reporters, they believe Dalvin Cook is the centerpiece of their rushing attack. I know they got Alexander Madison. I really hope he comes through so that we can – Sing the Hamilton, you know, music with <laughs> Alexander his name. Madison. Exactly, but in the meantime, I think Dalvin Cook is going to be a really, really solid running back this year. Uh, th if you were to say the reason I got him at sixteen is because he's injury, like I, I don't have him playing sixteen. I've got him playing fourteen. Uh, sign me up because I still see him as not having proven that he can play sixteen games. But if he's out there 16, I, I think you're low. And I assume your 16 ranking is based on him playing 16 games. You yes. just believe that it's a volume issue. Yep. Um, and I hope he proves you wrong for my dynasty team's sake. <laughs> um, wow, that's crazy. 71% of last year's fantasy points in that four-week span for Cook. Now, here's, here's the real issue. The real issue here is the absolute hatred that Andy Holloway has uh -oh. for Leonard Fournette. I don't know what Leonard Fournette, number four pick in the NFL draft, <laughs> did to Andy or Andy's family. Like, I, you know, I don't feel like Mike or I are crazy high on him, right? Yeah, but to say that we don't, that I don't dislike him would be. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be included. We, that would not be an accurate statement. But for fantasy purposes, we know he's going to touch the ball a ton and – you know, we've got him ranked relatively neutrally at 14 and 15, Mike, but Andy's over here pulling his ranking down. You've got him in the 20s. Splain yourself. Well, I really appreciate the fact that you introduced that with Leonard Fournette's greatest accomplishment as a professional athlete, which was to be drafted as high as he was drafted. But when you just look at the track record for Fournette, I, have, I just have so many things that trouble me. This is a guy with a 3.7 career average, and that's giving him credit because last year he was 3.2 a carry. That's not good. That's not good. <laughs> and, and, and the problem is, is like I, I will allow players, like if you want to talk me into Fournette, if the basis of an argument for a running back was based on you know the fact he's going to be heavily involved in the passing game, and that will neutralize some of the inefficiency in the running game, right? Like Melvin Gordon has had inefficient seasons, sure, but he receives a ton of, of of targets in the passing game. You have a quarterback in Foles that has not hyper targeted running backs historically. I, I think Fournette will be involved as much as a guy that's going to be on the field first and second down is is going to be involved. But here's what you've got going on with Fournette's career: you get to take the inefficiency. And you get to stack a, a few little fears on top of it. Like, there have been weight concerns with Leonard Fournette. Is he playing too heavy? Is he, is he going to play too heavy this year? You have the arrest. Yes, it was a slap on the wrist for the driving problem, but it was another, well, what's going on? Then the suspension by the team for his attitude, the disagreements with Tom Coughlin. These are too many, there, there are too many risky factors associated with Fournette and this was not a good football team last year. Now, everyone believes, okay, Foles is going to come in. It's a better situation than they had, but it's not an easy division. Okay? Indianapolis is great. Houston's great. Yep. Tennessee's going to be better than advertised, in my opinion. So I think you have... They're advertised as bad. So they're, <laughs> yeah, just, they're yeah, better so than I bad. Think they're ba I think they are advertised better than as bad. bad. It's good. <laughs> Here, here's Titans are lock. Here's so my I, I get the volume. I get the volume, but you're talking about a non-pass catching volume situation. I don't believe that's true because a non-pass catching situation is Sony Michelle, Legarrette Blount. No, we've that, talked about that that those are abysmal passing situations. No, those are non-passing situations. Leonard Fournette was on pace to have north of 30, you know, receptions, and now you lose T.J. Yeldon. They did not bring in another capable pass catching back. He is shockingly the most pass capable back on their roster so I think he's going to be involved more in that way but let's say he's not let's say he's the same pace he was last year right and you said what he was abysmal 3.2 yards per carry gross garbage even still on a per game basis he was the running back 13 with all that trash considered 
He was the running back 13. And that's including being behind guys like How did he do per that? game per Marlon Mack and Let me argue with you. Okay. Using a per game statistic on a player like Leonard Fournette is putting the blinders on. Because per game is it's his second greatest feature behind being drafted fourth overall. Per game has been his problem. If he could play all the games, he would have been fine. But he would have, have been good. But have you statted him missing games, or you statted him 16-game pace? I've statted him with respect to the fact that I believe that they will find other solutions in the passing game and that there is a high degree of risk with Leonard Fournette, whether it would be another suspension, the team n losing confidence in him halfway through the season, and realizing they don't even have to pay him next year if they don't want to because they find somebody else in their offense. I think that over the course of training camp, you're going to start to see names emerge that aren't Leonard Fournette. And I could be wrong. And it won't be Alfred Blue's name <laughs> that's going to be stealing things from him. But that is why I have hesitation. Because I don't think that the pass catching will wash out the risk. But I get, look, you guys have not been unfair to him. You've given him 14-15. You haven't said, hey, this is a banner year for Leonard Fournette. And part of that's got to be Jacksonville's got an uphill battle in that division too. You got to be ahead. You got to be winning. They're, they were a great, if their defense returns to form, then they can do the little A plus B equals Leonard Fournette on the field if he's healthy. Well, if my man Josh Allen has anything to say about that on defense, falling to the Jaguars, they're going to be running the ball. We'll see. We'll see what happens. All right. Jason. Yes. We're getting into some nitty gritty here because Mike and I, we did our rankings. This next guy, we ended up, I think for me, he ended up lower than I thought he would. Yeah, same here. I definitely see and recognize breakout potential, but I want to hear the argument why we are so uh, wrong about these initial season rankings. We have DJ Moore at 31 and 32. Mike, Jason has him up at 19. It's flabbergasting. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if that's an expression, but that's what it is. It is now. It's gasting. <laughs> so explain here, yourself. <clears throat> here's the reality <laughs> with DJ Moore. <laughs> DJ Moore was a very highly touted rookie, right? The, the first rookie wide receiver taken in last year's draft. One of our big takeaways from last season was to remember the slow nature of rookie wide receivers in fantasy football. They don't get off to a fast start. None of them did last year. It was really the second half of the season where you started to see some emerge, whether it was Dante Pettis or DJ Moore, whoever it is. And that's the usual trend if you take out 2014 when there was a bunch of Odell Beckham-type superstar rookie wide receivers. It really is the case where it's year two or year three where that breakout comes. Our job is not to just simply say what happened last year, but to project the future. I believe one of the explain yourselves that should be on this show is your ranking of Cam Newton, which uh, maybe we'll talk about somewhere down the line. I know it's more about how, how much you like other quarterbacks, but I believe that Carolina has a very good offense this year with Christian McCaffrey, with healthy Cam Newton, with year two for both DJ Moore and Curtis Samuel. And if they have a good offense and DJ Moore steps up into that clear cut wide receiver one role, now, I'm taking a risk, right? Because it could be Curtis Samuel who steps up. It could be, you know, someone else. But they lost Evan Funches. They lost a good amount of targets from last year. And DJ Moore, if you look they at They know where Funches is. They didn't lose him. <laughs> well, it's, it's hard to lose a man of that size. I yes. will grant you that. But the reality is he got so much better the second half of the year. You're talking about a difference in PPR first half of his rookie season from 795 to being up over 12, and that was with the last few games without Cam. He was still better in his game splits with Cam than with the backup. So I think DJ Moore takes a big step forward. If you look at his, you know, his games from week 10 on last year, he was on a pace in that rookie year, which we thought was kind of lousy, for over 1,000 yards. That was his pace. And if you think about how he did – when when there was still Cam and starting in that week 10 when they started to really give him more work from weeks 11 through 14, small sample, but he was the wide receiver 10, showing that he can... Yeah, he had a good stretch. He can be the guy. I believe that. And so, to me, when I stat this out, I'm looking at who's the number one for Carolina. I think it's going to be DJ Moore. I think he's talented. I liked him coming into last year's draft. And if he takes that step up, 19 could be when, too low. When's, when's Cam really had... Steve Smith. Steve Smith. 
Right. So you're talking about his rookie season. But Steve Smith was awesome. He was, but that was his rookie season. I'm saying right? that it has been a wide receiver committee situation in Carolina for yeah, a while. Yeah, with Calvin Benjamin and Devin Funchess, you are correct. It is There has not been Take a wide in. receiver to really have be a wide receiver one on the field. I think DJ Moore Well, I, I only bring that up not because I don't believe Moore could do it, but because you, you, you were saying he performed in a stretch, and I feel like Benjamin and Funchess and Ginn, they had stretches it's true. with Cam – uh, the only player that has been a consistent contributor with Cam has been early, you know, I guess you can say early well, Steve Olson. Smith, but it's really Greg Olson. Greg Olson, yeah. Um, it's interesting because I think we would all say McCaffrey's the one by way of volume. Sure. Uh, I, I, I have DJ Moore yeah. projected for more targets than Christian McCaffrey, so I would not say that. Okay. Mike, I, I, I'm I'm supposed to talk to you about your Austin Hooper ranking. Now, now <laughs> we Jay really we really want to talk about. No, this. we don't. Jason and I have him at 13 and 14. You have him at 26. And I want to say this for the record: I don't care that you have him at 26. Yeah, that's I what don't I'm care. saying. We're not going to talk about Austin Hooper. Excellent. Screw yeah. that guy. I, honestly, here's the deal: I've seen Austin Hooper get drafted as like a a top 10 tight end. No, thank you. It could happen, but you're not going to be happy along the way. He's the fourth option at best in that offense. No. Uh, no. You That's all him. the time you get on the, today's show, Austin. But I had really cool stats. Yeah? Give me one, Mike. You get one, and then we're not even going to argue with you. Uh, nearly 40% of his targets came in three games. <laughs> okay, good. That's pretty good stat. Thank good. I'd rather, I'd rather convince, I'd rather convince oh. you that Damian Williams oh. is bad. Yes, please. I Andy. would rather convince you that Damian Williams is, yes. no, is okay. no good. Oh, this is so great for me because I get to just sit back – and listen, I've I've besmirched Damian Williams so much, and now I I've been like the highest ranked on him this off season, I and I don't like it, and I really want to hear why he's the wide receiver. What do you, what do you you've got him? At well, he's not a, he's not my wide receiver. I sat at him as a running back this year. Yes, running back seventeen. Yes, now, tell us you have ten and eleven, and I couldn't feel more comfortable about Damian Williams at seventeen than I do. I really do. Um, <laughs> that's funny. Brooks put a note in here. He goes, "Is this is this a?" placeholder ranking until training camp <laughs> no he's at 17 because it's in, it's inclusive of exactly what damian williams is and here's the here's the story damian williams had a wonderful wonderful time with patrick mahomes he they did. were skipping through the meadows oh crap did mahomes go somewhere no oh okay thank you though for that. good that Man, was, I, got, I got a little bit worried that was impressive 5.1 a carry with patrick mahomes last year you gotta love it now, this wasn't Damian. Look, Jason didn't like Damian Williams. Correct. And that's because his entire career is unlikable. Correct. There's nothing likable about his career. 3.3 a carry, 3.4 a carry, 3.7 a carry. I like his pass catching. Damian Williams has been an unlikable player, to say the least. The thing about it is he was in a perfect situation. I believe you could have put 100 running backs in Damian Williams' situation last season. Mm -hmm. uh, no team. No Amen, brother. No player played with a lead more than Damian Williams. They, he played with a lead uh, more than any other running back in football. You know what he did? He faced 6.4 men in the box on average because Patrick Mahomes demands you to pay attention to the secondary. So he faced almost the fewest guys in the box on average. He also got what was there. That's it. That's all he did. He ranked 112. 112 in yards created per carry. He's that would not be yards good. beyond the auto blocked amount. So he oh by the way, that was like like almost the worst. This is the argument I was making to you guys last year. But but it would be wrong of me if I ignored the fantasy production and because he's in the same situation. That would be the Mike argument, right? He's mm -hmm. in the same boat. They didn't go spend a high draft pick. They drafted Darwin Thompson in the sixth round. They picked up an undrafted free agent, who by the way led the entire college football and pass catching still, air booby still air undrafted uh, and but the thing is is Damian Williams I believe that there is risk on Damian Williams this season not being as efficient not being as perfect Tyreek Hill may not be on the back end changing the amount of many faces in the box I think that you've seen historically even when Jamal Charles was there and I think we talked about this before maybe it was on the footcast you know you've had Charkandrick West who would come in for a drive or a third down. I think you're going to have capable guys. I think they're going to like Darwin. They brought Darwin in for a reason. 
You've got also Daryl Williams, who never dropped the pass. 100% catch rating last year. Out of how many targets? 100 million. Um, Impressive. No, that is, well, I don't. That's, that's, that's about uh, 100 million more than I thought. And the thing is, is obviously Carlos Hyde is there. But here, here's my major, my major point. If Carlos Hyde siphons some first and second down work, some. They went out, they paid for him quickly. And then you do integrate some rotation. There's just more risk to Damian Williams than anybody else I rank in that top 12. I don't see the same variables that exist. I don't see the same outlier season. Do you consider Damian Williams' season an outlier? I do, based historically on his data. So when I look at the efficiency metrics of, like, he didn't really get more. Thank you, Brooks. Uh, Daryl Williams, three receptions on three targets. Is that true? Get that stat out of my face. Is that true? Three? Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. Stick to the hundred percent, Andy. <laughs> Says stick, stick to your guns. Look, that's terrible. I just had to see. Okay. Thanks, Brooks. I could play running back for Patrick Mahomes, and I've got a shot at catching three targets and being. That's done. a terrible stat. That's a terrible <laughs> stat, and it should not submarine my argument. <laughs> Carlos Hyde is a terrible pass catcher. He's not going to steal pass catching duty from. Agreed. Damian Williams. Williams will be great. You know how great he'll be? About seventeen. Mm. I love everything you just said I think that the role of the Kansas City Chiefs RB1 is worth more than the RB17 agreed which is why I don't have him ranked that low but no I, just, I mean I if love it's the, the same as last year I'm wrong I'm just dead wrong I just love the truth that freaking anybody could do it well like, it's nice to know you could throw it to Darrell Williams as much as you want he will <laughs> never drop a pass you say best hands of all time <laughs> right yes exactly I, I mean you say Carlos Hyde doesn't have pass catching in his Repertoire, he's not a good pass catcher. He's not. He did fine for one necessary season of that no, in San no, Francisco. He, yes, he did. They, he was force-fed targets, yes. and he was really bad and inefficient with them. And he had a bunch of drops. He's a bad pass catcher. I promise you, he's a good pass catcher from Patrick Mahomes. No, no. Yes, my, he's bad. My point is Damian Williams sucks, but he's going to be – And that's fine. Like, but the running back one for Kansas City is going to be great. Yeah, I've, my argument has always been I want Kansas City's running back. I'm looking at ffstatistics.com where they break down – no, uh, running back finished by coach. Do you know how many times the running the the RB one has finished seventeen or lower for head coach Andy Reid? I do not. Four times. It's just four times out of Andy Reid's ten thousand year well, career. But how, name name the running backs. You can name them on on one hand. Sean McCoy, McCoy Jamal, Jamal Charles, Charles, Kareem Hunt. Sure, guys, that, but guys that catch the ball. And Damian Williams. Well, that's fair. Damian's one that's it's fine. Don't you feel like there might be more risk to Damian in that top oh, yes, twelve yes. than any other for those reasons? Yeah, I, I don't I won't argue the fact that, that there is absolutely I did my risk best, Jason. For and for I Damian Williams. I did my best and I submarined myself with three catches from <laughs> Daryl Williams. All right. Jason, yes. you've got Mark Andrews mm. up at ten. Got him where he belongs. That makes him an extremely relevant fantasy tight end, a sleeper tight end. I loved Mark Andrews to the point of I would went and traded him or traded for him from you. Mm -hmm. Shut up. But I don't have him that high. I do have him, though. He's on my team. Did I mention that? He's on my team, he, not yours. I, you did mention that he was traded away from the champion uh, team to yeah. your team. Yes, yeah, that's correct. Is. What is happening? All right, so Mark Andrews is high. When I put out my first rankings, that was one of the names that came back a lot. Like was like, holy Mark Andrews. Right. You know, like you guys, you really believe. Or oftentimes it was, Who's Mark Andrews? Like, a lot of people were saying they didn't know who Mark Andrews is, and that's fine because he wasn't a relevant fantasy option last year, and he was a rookie. He was for the putrid Baltimore passing game. And so I get not knowing who Mark Andrews is, but let me explain who he is. He was a very prolific pass-catching tight end in college. I wasn't sure if that was just because he had a great quarterback or if he was good. He looked a little pudgy to me when he was running, but he did a lot of – he did a lot of damage at college. That's, that's mean. I just calls it how I <laughs> sees it, Mike. Then he comes to the NFL, and he passes the eye test in the NFL as a rookie, which is rare. He was pretty darn good. In fact, he was good to the point of uh, – I, I realize that the touchdowns did not flow for Lamar Jackson or for Joe Flacco this last year, but as far as yardage goes, he, he was – since the year 2000, he was the sixth highest – yardage for a rookie tight end and what? yeah and if you because rookie tight ends don't do much right but he showed that he can and here's the coolest part look at the splits with Flacco because you might go well Flacco loves tight ends he can only throw like two yards but he had a pace Mark Andrews did with uh with Joe Flacco he was on pace for 434 yards 
which is sure when he was playing with Lamar Jackson, he was on pace for over 700 yards as a rookie. That's fantastic. Who was who's who's their number one wide receiver? Who was it last year? It was Michael Crabtree. Was Crabtree? Who uh. was their number two? It was John Brown. So the the targets of any veterans there are gone. They brought in a couple rookies, but they're still rookies. The only rapport that he really has with anyone who had target volume is Willie Sneed and Mark Andrews. Mark Andrews showed well. This is a system that has that knows how to use the tight end. So I think Mark Andrews takes a huge step forward. The real question is going to be touchdowns. Does he get enough from Lamar Jackson to be in that top ten? I think he does. What do you say to somebody who feels Andrews took advantage of Hayden Hurst's absence and Hurst Boyle too involved for Andrews to be relevant? No, I think that I think that this is a system they want to run the ball so much that they use multiple tight ends on every single play. I'm not worried about Hayden Hurst. You know, last year you had you had Nick Boyle stepping up. You had Dosecki's Max Williams, who is now gone from the team as well at the tight end position. So I, you know, whatever you gain in Hayden Hurst, you lose elsewhere. I loved watching Mark Andrews play. It was good. I talked about it a lot last year. I loved watching him play. He can stretch the field. So yeah. it'll be interesting. I, like I, I didn't have the courage to rank him that high. A little sleeper tight end out there. Yeah, I like it. I like it. I'm going to move him up. Sweet. Well, he's free. He's free. <laughs> so, like, it's just do you want him for free or not? Uh, Sterling Shepard, Mike, you are burying Sterling Shepard. Uh, I don't understand how he could be this low if he is the number one receiver on the outside in New York. Maybe he's not. Why don't you explain yourself? Mike and I, or Jason and I, have him high 20s, not even in the wide receiver two. I don't right. feel like we're giving him too much love 29 27 but you got him at 39 explain you yourself pretty be, much got your middle finger up pointed to, at to Sterling. Be fair, i went in i took another look because i wanted to be sure i gave him a little boost i've got him all the way up now at number 37 oh that's very well how, he's got to feel great about that so it's i just yeah here's the thing sterling shepherd in 2018 here were his fantasy splits with and without Odell Beckham. 12 games with OBJ, 11.38 PPR points a game. Four games without him, 11 PPR points a game. Let's, really took advantage. Let's open that sample up. Let's get 2017 in there as well. 16 games with Odell Beckham, 11.26 points. We're seeing a theme here. And 11 without, he got up to 13. So you saw a bump of two points. And I'm just, I do some guys are just not made to be Batman, and I, Sterling Shepard is not. The problem is Batman has left Gotham. There is there is no primary hero on this team and because Golden Tate is not. It, it, he's not a number one to me. Golden Tate's fantastic, and I think Sterling Shepard is a good receiver as well. It's almost like but they need Odell Beckham Jr. It's, it's almost like they need Batman. a number one wide receiver on this team. Well, I, and I made many of the arguments about a potential fantasy wasteland for New York when I yes. talked about Golden Tate being my ice player last week. So I can certainly understand where you're coming from. Do you believe I, – I would imagine you have Tate rated higher yes, than Yes, I do. Okay. I, yes, I do. I just – I don't think that Shepard is I, – I, I say, should say the New York Giants passing game I don't think is going to step up to a point where Sterling Shepard is going to be fantastic. And now – when you, you might be at, rolling the dice week to week on those right, guys. When you, when you look at guys who are ranked you know, 28 to 37, this is not a huge point differential. So I, I slip one more touchdown in there, and Sterling Shepard is going to rise. But for me, he's at a point where I am effectively saying, I don't care. I'm not letting the allure of Sterling Shepard. Oh, is he the number one? Oda Beckham's gone. That's, that's 150 targets and 1,300 yards every single season. I'm not going to let that... Uh, siren, lure me into you know, the island and wreck my boat. You know, it's actually interesting because I think it. there are teams. Tennessee comes to mind. Jacksonville last year comes to mind. Where you didn't really want to start any of their receivers. Right. But the fact that you have a hole that was once filled by Beckham, the best receiver, could trick people. You know, if Beckham's not out of the equation, if you're just looking objectively at Shepard and Tate, 
and whatever else they have, you might admit, you know, you might make a better decision than thinking, oh man, he's going to step up and be the be the Beckham that they need, or be eighty percent of Beckham. Right. He's not Beckham, is your point? Exactly. Uh, and Golden Tate is not Beckham either. There is no Beckham. No, there is only one. There he's on one. the Cleveland Browns. You traded him away, Gettleman. I'm Beckham. <laughs> For your Batman <laughs> reference there. Yeah, we get it. Oh, I thought that was Dave. <laughs> hey, it's me. Dave Beckham. I'm Gettleman. This, that's been his the long con the whole time. We're going to look down, and we're going to see a number zero, and you're not going to know who it is. And he's going to – Oh, Gettleman's going to be on the gonna field? And he's going to go in there. He's going to take some snaps. He's going to take the helmet off. It's me. Gettleman. Dave. Uh, okay. We got a couple more to get through right. here. Um, Nick Chubb? Jason, Nick you want to talk about Nick Chubb? You know, I do and I don't because the reality is I'm uncomfortable with where I have him ranked. And I'm a little uncomfortable where I have him Mike ranked. has him at 13. I have him at 14. Jason at 23. Mike, are you uncomfortable because you want to move him down? Yeah. Wow. I don't Something's want Something's happening here on the I show. I don't want to, but I don't know, man. All right. Well, I'm here's <laughs> a little worried. Here's the case. Here's the case for Nick Chubb. Because I feel like your whole case is just like Kareem Hunt's going to come back and I don't like him because of that. So on a season-long basis, that is a major portion of this case. I want to let people know. I want the Folkland, when they're at their draft, to realize like I've, I've ranked these guys on a season-long basis. At the draft, Chubb would be ahead in my rankings because I, I like guys that get off to start, strong starts. I think that's you know going to happen for Nick Chubb. So my ranking will look stupid the first couple weeks of the season. But the question is, when Kareem Hunt comes back, what happens to Nick Chubb the second half of the season? And I think uh, what, what I chose to do when I looked at the paces of uh, all, all sorts of different factors, but I, you know, I, I took a look at the high end of Chubb. When Chubb took over and was excellent from, uh, you know, he didn't really get the start until week seven. From week seven on, he was on pace for 282 carries. That's awesome. Yeah. That's 17.6 carries a game. You don't see that too often anymore. Uh, there's a few guys that have that, and Chubb looked like he was going to be one of those guys. So what I did is I gave him that pace, that incredible pace of 282 carries when he's the guy. But when Kareem Hunt comes back, I took away six carries a game. That's it. Just six fewer carries for Nick Chubb. And what it does is it gives him a grand total of, of 233 carries on the season, which is well below what I think he paces in the first half. Because he's not a pass-catching back, because he's not a guy, you know, you talk about Leonard Fournette not being a pass-catching back. You know, Chubb was on basically that that pace, about 30 receptions last year once he got to start. They, the offseason has been very, uh, the Cleveland Browns have been very big fans of Duke Johnson saying he's a big part of this. Well, offense. they're saying that he's not going to get traded. They're, well, but they're yeah. saying he's, that he's not going to get traded because they have plans for him. That's that's the rationale they've given. Is like we we're going to use him. We we want him here. So my point is, if he's not the pass catching back and he's only a true behemoth carry volume guy in the first half, and then a decent carry guy the second half. If every running back in the league plays sixteen. Well, Nick Chubb's going to be lower in rankings, and right now I've got everybody statted out for 16 minus known suspensions. Oh, well, I, I see a few problems with the comparison to Fournette. One, it's not 50-50, first of all. It's 66% of your fantasy season for the regular season, right, for, for Chubb. He's going to be there. But he was a 5.2 a carry, not a 3.2 a carry guy. He's on a team that should win the division, not a team that should lose the division. He's younger he doesn't have an injury history. Fournette does have the injury history. Uh, Nick, yeah, Nick Chubb, Chubb has a, Chubb a got major, in, major injury history. In the NFL? No. Oh, well, okay. In his eight life. touchdowns but just, just last saying. year in limited work. 192 carries, eight touchdowns. He could have 12 touchdowns before Hunt ever touches the field. The, That's the thing is this is a great offense. They do not – look, you're going to say whatever you want to say about Duke Johnson, even when it was just Duke Johnson and Nick Chubb they didn't use Duke Johnson enough last year. They're not going to all of a sudden like, oh, man, you're throwing a fit on social media. You want to be traded. We're going to use you more to really show you. That doesn't make sense to me. So here's the thing. You bring up the, the, the great yards per carry, the great touchdown. He had a number of super long breakaway runs 
that really I like those. Oh, no, no, no. They're great. And if he does them again, you'll be happy. But those are not usually those things that repeat year after year after year. Otherwise, there would be guys that just this is his eighth year in the league. And every year he gets four or five breakaway touchdowns like there. Those don't really exist. Tyreek might have been the first guy that like looked on pace for something like that. Otherwise, I, you know, I'm not going to just assume he gets those every year. And a couple of those came when he was the change of pace back early in the season. And it was like he had a game where he's one carry for all of the field. That was what he did. <laughs> so I and I like Nick Chubb. I think he gets off to a good start. I'm right. willing to draft him. But I think at the end of the year, he's going to be lower than most people, than, certainly than where he was drafted. So if you draft him, use him, trade him. That's what I would do. Okay, fair enough. I'm supposed to talk about Will Fuller now. Okay, uh, what do you got? What do you got for Will Fuller? Hey, the, I feel hey. like I should just accuse you both for I mean, 39 and 36 for Will Fuller. You have to be banking on injury, right? No, it's uh, how can you not in 11 games? Oh, here we go. He's only played. He's played 11 games with Deshaun Watson. Sure, yeah, on pace for 1137 yards, 16 touchdowns, yes. 65 receptions. When he plays with yes. Deshaun Watson, who we all believe, what do we have him? Three? Yeah. Deshaun Watson, the number three quarterback in fantasy. Fuller's either hurt or he's well ahead of both of your projections. Or he's playing, again, sort of like yours, limited number. Or he's playing with Kiki QT on the field, in yep. which case his numbers are drastically lower because there's three wide receivers that could catch the ball. And just about everything across the board ends up going down. Loses about a half a touchdown a How game. How many games did they play together last four. year? Four. Four. So four games when QT was a rookie and before Phil Fuller got hurt. Yep. So, I mean, it's a, that, that's I said, enough it's of a, a small a, sample. No, no, no. It, it, I mean, you know, I, I don't have him. Projected it's really as nice low playing as, across from DeAndre Hopkins. Yes. Yes. He when scores you're a the touchdown only other a game guy. when he's playing with Deshaun Watson. So I just think that. You have an extreme situation where he's either going to finish better. I have a hard time believing he's going to finish as the as a wide receiver four in that offense with Deshaun Watson if he's playing sixteen. It's, That's his, my point. His targets get cut near or were cut nearly in half. Uh, the three games where Kiki was not on the field, he was averaging over eight and a half targets, and that drops down to four point seven five. I mean, it's just the opportunity goes down. Yeah, I I don't. Have he's a not a player that lives on PPR. So I, I agree, but, but you still need you still need the opportunity. You still need that actual target to I, go to the house. I am curious here because I think this is where Mike and I probably chose. I mean, while we're projecting, you've got to make decisions as to who's going to be the one, who's going to be the two. I'm curious where your target projections are for Will Fuller compared to Kiki QT. Because I've got Kiki QT well ahead of Will Fuller in targets. Granted, they're not nearly as valuable targets they're not the i have field. i have kiki ahead of will fuller in targets what are your numbers show I, me, show I me like yours a, i'll show you mine i gave qt 109 targets okay i've got him at 115 pretty similar uh, but i gave fuller about 100 and i've got him at 82 so that's yeah. probably i've still got him with eight touchdowns 750 and last yards. year i mean last year he was pacing at about 100 in the games that he played even though the qt factor that you bring up so it, that's what it comes down to is your point i mean it makes sense if Fuller is not on the field, he will not produce. If Fuller is not receiving targets to the tune of 100, he's not going to have enough receptions to, to, to be hyper-efficient and, and you know do anything with it. I will say this. I have not uh, redone my stats since losing Ryan Griffin, and while I, you know most of those will be going to other tight ends that are on the field, they don't have a veteran tight end, I think, that's going to take up and just soak that up. So there will be a little bit more to go around. And more importantly than the – okay, Ryan Griffin, whatever – if Kiki QT and Will Fuller actually stay on the field this year, which is a big if, but if that happens, Deshaun Watson is going to be unbelievable in fantasy this year. I mean, I really believe he he has he has shown us nothing but being an elite fantasy option, an elite real life quarterback. He's just been great. And if he actually has those three weapons, right. Whew. All right, let's uh close it out with this. Christy. All right, and we very exciting, by the way. Pristine deal of the day. Todd Gurley, a signed Rams jersey yesterday, $68 at pristineauction.com. Oh, someone still believes. $68. Hundreds of daily auctions. But here's the cool thing. When you go to pristineauction.com, that's P-R-I-S-T-I-N-E auction.com, 
and you sign up for uh, a free account and you put in the registration code BALLERS on sign up, they're just giving you five bucks. Yeah, this is new. So it is brand new. They're just going to give you $5 free and clear, no strings attached. It's not like you're paying for anything when you sign up to browse auctions. But if you go to pristineauction.com and you sign up and use the registration code BALLERS, you get five bucks, browse hundreds of daily auctions. And then when the player that you love pops up, and you can now, snag an amazing helmet or jersey or cleat that's autographed authentically by your favorite player. That jersey wasn't even 68 bucks. No, it was $5 uh, 60, cheaper. 63 Yeah. So that is it for today's show. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for enduring the explain yourself. Explain yourself. We'll catch you on Thursday. On the flip side. Goodbye. Tight. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.